And this particular movie, Mary Ryan Detective, and, and this is a, a lovely catch line, I don't know if my friend Leonard Maltin appreciates it, but this movie is so rare that it isn't in Leonard Maltin's movie guide. <laughs> and I love that. Uh, but this was made by Columbia in 1949, and Columbia really had a talent for grinding out the series movies, B-movies that were entertaining, they were made very fast, very economically, but they were consistently well done and entertaining, such as the Whistler series, Boston Blackie, uh, the crime doctor with Warner Baxter as Dr. Matthew Ordway, and so forth. And this particular film was going to be the start of the series, and it somehow didn't end up that way, and we'll talk more about that with our special guest. But what makes Mary Ryan Detective a fast, engrossing, a wonderfully entertaining movie is our special guest star who's here with us. Um, I'm going to get a little bit personal. One of the most gratifying things about uh, doing this now for a dozen years and programming the movies and the festival and the Film Noir Foundation for me is the relationships that you form with, with people doing the same thing and so forth. And I have to say, uh, one of the most gratifying experiences of doing all of this is getting to know Marsha Hunt. And uh, Marsha is really an inspirational person. I remember leaving her house one time and my mother called me and said, what are you doing? And I said, well, we were at Marsha's and we're leaving. And she said, so how do you feel? And I said, well, I just left Marsha after two hours, so I'm ready to take on world hunger. <laughs> <laughs> and Marsha is more than a consummate actress, she's a consummate human being. And uh, we're going to have Marsha here and talk to her after the movie, her career, that really spans almost a good portion of the sound era since she came to Hollywood in 1935 and is still going strong. So I want everyone to really give a warm welcome to one of the great stars of this or any era and my friend, Ms. Marsha Hunt. So when you saw it the first time, it was kind of like when we, when we told you, hey, we found this film and so forth, and you didn't even remember it. Has any of this come back to you through subsequent screenings, or is it just kind of, this is a voyage of discovery? It's a voyage of discovery. I have to confess to you, this is one film I couldn't remember. <laughs> well, there have been 62 of them, but I can remember all of them except that one. <laughs> I have no explanation for this, except possibly that it, it was sandwiched in between a whole lot else going on in my life. I was just between my first two Broadway plays in New York, and I was out here briefly, and my personal life was in a degree of turbulence and pressure of schedules and careers and uh, a bit of politics, all of that. We'll talk and about that. What with one thing or another, this just slipped on by. And uh, I couldn't wait to see it. And <laughs> when we saw it at the Egyptian Theater in, in Hollywood, I had a very good time. I was seeing <laughs> a movie I had no recollection of making. <laughs> and every now and then, a moment, a setting would come back, and I'd kind of say, Oh, yeah. Yeah, I remember that. But the rest was news. Well, you know, it's, it's fun, isn't it? It is. Yeah. <laughs> uh, in, in looking up this film, there really wasn't a lot there. But one thing that, that tickled me was that the turkey farm, where most of the action took, was on Reseda Boulevard in Northridge. <laughs> and that turkey, I, the name escapes me, but they're still in business. They're up in Santa Clara, Clarita now. <laughs> and their, their website says since 1934. So uh, there's, a, there's a part of that that still exists. But more about you. This, this was at a point in your career, you had just, in your life, that you had just said you had um, 
had left MGM, and then there was the the flight to Washington in what was that forty seven, I believe, yes. and yes. so forth. And talk a little bit about that time to put it in context with uh, your career and the politics, because this film was going to be the first of a contemplated series, and it was released. Uh, uh, in 49 and then after that came the the infamous red channels and uh, as they say it kind of goes downhill from there talk a little bit about the, the time and the politics and how that all affected you in your life and your career it was the most tumultuous time everything crowded together at once I was recently married and blissfully and it lasted 40 years and so we got it. We were lucky. In the midst of that, the film career was interrupted. I ventured, I lost a daughter who came a day early and didn't make it. And no, she was very early. She lived a day and didn't make it. Uh, blessedly, a couple of movies, one at Republic, called The Inside Story, which I've right. only just seen again. Yes. And, uh, what was it, Raw Deal. Raw Deal, along. we just hit the screen. That came along in 47, yeah. right between the flight to Washington. I speak of that as if you knew what I was talking about, but it did change my life and a great many people's lives. Thirty some of us from the film industry flew to Washington to defend 19 very gifted screenwriters' rights as citizens who were being badly mistreated by a, a rogue committee of our Congress of the United States, the House Committee on Un American Activities. Boo. Yeah. Hiss and boo. They were, they were finally. Uh, put out of existence, but they were anti-Semitic, anti-everything, anti-American freedoms. And somehow their virus really reached the top executives at studios. And it was a, a very strange time of turbulence, of sides being drawn. And when 19 writers one or two of whom I knew very well and loved as, not only as friends, but as very good Americans, were ordered to Washington to account for themselves and to answer questions there was no right to ask them. We flew to Washington, we 30-some, you've probably heard about the flight, the Bogarts were along and uh, Danny Kay. John Houston, and Willie John Wyler, Houston. Evelyn yeah. Keyes. Yeah. Yeah. And a who's who of writers, directors. And Ira Gershwin, the greatest lyricist perhaps of the day. The Gershwin brother, we don't hear about too much. Anyhow, that flight came along in 47 and really changed things. The sides were drawn. People were fired not for anything but a, a cloud over the reputation. Perhaps they might be communists. And even or, communism or you, was or not you illegal. Sign, you sign the wrong petition or, some, or nothing. Oh and, yeah, I, I had know. signed two or three things to help end the war, and as we all did, things you believed in, you signed. Well, these were found mysteriously guilty later. But the flight to Washington came just before raw deal right and <laughs> and it was a raw deal <laughs> it was it was a yeah. glorious experience yeah. working with a wonderful cast mm -hmm. and who knew that it was going to be in the vanguard of noir films mm -hmm. which had not even been named yet mm -hmm. when i asked the cast we lunched together in raw deal and i told them i'd been sent a script of a play on broadway and I had never done a play, a professional play, anywhere. I'd gone right into films as a teenager. And here was a Broadway script that was good. And it was about Hollywood, which I knew something about by then. 
a good role, well-written comedy, and I asked them about it. Should I take the plunge? It's a terrible way to... They want to star me in this thing, and I've never been on stage professionally. They all said, it's a good role. You believe in the script? Take it and run. So I did. I plunged. And things that helped me plunge were the fact that it was to be directed by my very favorite director, Jules Dasson, who maybe who, if any of you are film buffs, you would know that he directed Never on Sunday and also wrote and, and starred in it with uh, Melina Mercuri. But Jules Dasson had directed a couple of comedies I was in at uh, MGM. Letter to Evie. Yeah, and The Affairs of Martha. And The Affairs yeah. of Martha. I was Martha and I was Evie, and we had a lovely time working together. So that was Joe Dawson, and I felt if he was directing my first play anywhere and starring on Broadway the first time out, that I would be in safe, good hands. Also, it meant starring opposite someone I had been swept away by watching and hearing who created the, the lead role in Oklahoma. Alfred Drake on Broadway, and I got to play opposite Alfred. Well, this was the start of lifetime friendships, and it was a beautiful first plunge into legitimate theater. Amazingly, I had beginner's luck. The critics were gallant beyond description, <laughs> and I stayed on for more. The second one put me on the cover of Life magazine, a solo cover of Life. You, there's nowhere to go from there. Really. 